morning and a very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, I am Parameshwaran Sankaran. Um, this year is uh, IMSC, we are celebrating the golden jubilee year of IMSC and as part of our outreach program, we have been having workshops for at various levels and uh, in the past we have had workshops for school teachers, school students and this one is the last uh, in this series, uh, it is for college lecturers. Um, I have a few announcements to make before we can start. Uh, the tea will be served near the um, elevators on this floor uh, in the morning and afternoon, morning at 10.30, afternoon at uh, 3 o'clock. There will be group photo uh, around before 1 o'clock, so around 1 o'clock in front of the library we will all assemble for a group photo before lunch. Lunch will be served on the other side. Uh, we have this guest house complex across the road from here, from the institute. So that will be at 1 o'clock after the group photo. And uh, there will be no formal chairpersons for various sessions. The speakers for today will be first by Professor K7 and then Amritan Shu Prasad. Uh, he will talk on uh, al linear algebra, some topics in linear algebra. Then it will be followed by uh, Vishwanath and Raghavan and also Jaya Iyer. So uh, I will let them explain to you what they will, the title of their talks and what they will talk about and so on. Uh, I think I have said all that I wanted to say. One final thing is I request all of you to switch off your mobiles or put it in silent mode so that the lecture can go on without interruption. Okay. I let now Thank you very much. So, I will be talking about some important uh, partial differential equations. So, differential equations is in the heart of analysis. Everything changes in nature. Nature is constantly evolving and differential equations tell you how things evolve. So, they are the very important class of uh, uh, important topic to study. And many of the topics in analysis came from the understanding of the methods of solving differential equations. Theory of summability, then notions of cardinality, set theory, Lebesgue integration. So many topics have all come because people wanted to understand the methods which they were using to solve differential equations. So in the 18th and 19th centuries, lot of many, all the problems studied by Euler, Lagrange, all these people were problems of a practical nature and they tried to solve some differential equations and in the process many things got clarified and so on. Today I will uh, look at some partial differential equations which you know of course are differential equations involving derivatives in partial derivatives. When of functions of several variables. So, we uh, look at the Cauchy problem for a second order equation which is of the form a u x x, the subscripts denote the derivatives plus 2 b u x y plus c u y y equals d. If a, b and c and d are just functions of the independent variables x and y, then you call this a linear equation. And the equation is called quasi-linear because it is linear in the highest order derivatives, but not otherwise. So if these functions depend also on the dependent variable, namely u and its first derivatives. So what is a Cauchy problem? You take a smooth curve, parameterize by x equals fs, y equals g of s. And then you want to solve this differential equation subject to some prescribed data on this curve. So you can prescribe u equals h of s and the first derivative with respect to x and y. But you cannot do all of this arbitrarily because h of s is u of f s g s because if you substitute u is h of s and then f and g are the uh, parametric forms. So, if you differentiate this, then you get h dash equals phi f dash plus c 
g dash and so there is some kind of compatibility which all of them must have so one cannot arbitrarily prescribe all the three functions what one could do independently is prescribe u and the normal derivative along this curve because the normal derivative will be a linear combination of ux and uy and therefore you can prescribe that independently but if you prescribe these three then all of them cannot be prescribed independently. Now we go and uh, first we have the equation itself and then if we go back and differentiate this condition phi equals ux and c equals uy with respect to s you get two more equations f dash ux x equals plus g dash ux y equals phi dash f dash ux y plus g dash u y y equals c dash. So, if you want to compute the second derivatives on this curve uniquely then the determinant the three the unknowns are u x x u y y and u x y. So, if you want those them to be determined properly then this determinant should not vanish. So, you say the curve is a characteristic curve if this determinant which works out if you calculate it is a g dash square minus 2 b f dash g dash plus c f dash square equals 0 for all points on the on it and it is said to be non characteristic if it is always non zero. So, that you can invert this now what is the point of all this because if I can invert then I can compute the second derivatives now that is one foot of the camel into the tent once I can compute the second derivatives I can iterate this procedure compute third derivatives fourth derivatives and so on. So, in principle I can compute all the derivatives then I can try to write the solution at a in a neighborhood of a point on the curve as a Taylor series one because I know all the derivatives. So, all this is very formal, but one can prove a theorem for instance if the data is analytic and the curve is analytic then of course, this method actually works. So, if you have a non characteristic curve and Cauchy data then you can hope to solve the problem uniquely at least in the neighborhood of the solution. So, if you have a characteristic curve then of course, those right hand side has to satisfy some compatibility conditions because the determinant is 0 and therefore, you cannot in general solve. So, characteristic curves if you prescribe data on them you cannot solve. Now, how to determine which are these characteristic curves you have this equation namely the determinant equal to 0 and you can rewrite it in terms of dy because g dash is dy by ds and f dash is dx by ds. So, if you rewrite it then you get dy by dx equals b plus or minus root of b square minus ac by a. So, if b square minus ac is less than 0 there are no characteristic curves at all and we call this a elliptic equation. If it is 0 there is one real characteristic we call it parabolic if it is greater than 0 then there are two real characteristics and you call it a hyperbolic equation. So, this is very similar to what you have been doing with conic sections the terminology is the same a x square plus 2 h x y plus b y square equals 1. So, that is a conic it depends an ellipse if you have the determinant condition if you have a parabola or a hyperbola depending on how the determinant which is exactly the same relation which we have here. We can do this in more than two variables also. So, I do not want to get into the details of that, but this can be generalized. So, again we classify second order quasi linear equations as elliptic, hyperbolic and parabolic and the three prototypes are the Laplace equation Laplace in u equals 0 or the Poisson's equation Laplace in u equals f. So, that is a homogeneous equation this is an inhomogeneous equation or the heat equation which is parabolic or the wave equation which is a hyperbolic equation. So, Laplace in u of course, is sigma d to u by d x i square. So, this is the so we can extend this. So, what I want to do today is to give you a flavor as to how we go about solving this equation I would not do the most general and all these things I will solve try to solve them in R n give the formulae and then see just looking at the solution try to predict some of the properties of the solution. So, that is the idea for today's uh, lecture. So, let us start with the Laplace equation Laplace in u equal to 0. 
So then we call u as a harmonic function. Now this equation is rotation invariant. If you make a transformation of variables using an orthogonal matrix, a rotation in space, this equation won't change. So if the equation doesn't depend on the rotation of the axis, it is natural to expect a radial solution because if you do polar coordinates you have r and theta if something does not depend on theta then you think it depends only on r. So the same thing in higher dimensions only instead of theta you will have n minus 1 different variables. So we try to look for a solution in a radial solution which depends only on the length of the vector. So we go to polar coordinates and this you certainly have done probably in the advanced calculus courses when you for your students. So in polar coordinates if uh, when we rewrite the Laplacian and if you omit the theta part namely the uh, dependence on this uh, spherical part then only r will come in. So you get u double dash plus n minus 1 by r u dash equal to 0 where n is the dimension of the space okay. So we can uh, solve that u, u double dash by u dash is 1 minus n by r so you can get u dash as c by r power n minus 1 and which will give you u r equals b log r plus c if n equals 2 and b by r to the n r power n minus 2 plus c if n is bigger than equal to 3. It is a bit slightly bad notation here sorry for that and I, ha I should have put c here and b here does not matter it, they are all constants they do not We choose a particular value for b and c for a very specific reason. So you call this a fundamental solution phi of x is minus 1 by 2 pi log mod x if n equals 2 and n into n minus 2 alpha n mod x to the n minus 2 if n is bigger than or equal to 3 for x not 0 all this is defined only when x is not 0 there is a singularity at the origin and alpha n is the volume of the unit ball in Rn and the formula for alpha n is a very nice calculation. Uh, it is pi power n by 2 by gamma to the n by 2 plus 1 where gamma is the gamma function. So if you put uh, n equals 2 you get gamma 2 which is 1 factorial and therefore 1 and uh, pi. So alpha 2 is pi which is the area of the unit circle. If you took n equals 3 and work this out you will get 4 by 3 pi which is the volume of the unit ball in R3. Okay. So x to phi x is harmonic as long as x is not equal to 0 away from the origin where the singularity is there this function is a harmonic function because we solved the differential equation and so if you translate the origin we have x going to phi of x minus y is harmonic as long as x is not equal to y. So now if you multiply by a function in Rn so x going to phi of x minus y fy that does not depend on x. So this is again harmonic in x as a function of x as long as x is not equal to y. So if you take a finite sum of such functions they will also be harmonic because the operator is linear except at a finite number of points if I take y1, y2, yn and so on some n points if you omit those n points elsewhere this function is harmonic because each individually they are all harmonic. Then what can one say about the integral? Okay, integral is a limit of a sum in some case. So what is is this a harmonic function at all? Answer is uh, no, it is very misleading. So we have the following theorem. Suppose f is a, you can uh, simplify, uh, I mean uh, these hypotheses are not the most uh, general ones. I am just taking it for uh, as an example. So if f is a twice differentiable function with compact support that means it vanishes outside a compact set in Rn then you define u integral Rn phi of x minus y fy dy. This integral is well defined because f has compact support and therefore this integral can uh, make sense. Then in fact u is a C2 function and Laplacian u equals f. So superposing all these harmonic functions on one on top of the other we produce a solution of the Poisson's equation. So this is the Poisson's equation solution and you can of course as I said for other f also this is true. You might have heard the word Green's function and so on 
when dealing with PDEs. Green's function is just a modification of this fundamental solution here to take care of boundary conditions. So always the solution in the uh, for the elliptic problem is given as a sort of convolution. Uh, this is a convolution product here integral phi of x minus y f y dy that is a convolution and you get it. Okay, so let us see some interesting properties of this. So let omega be an open set and u is in C2 a harmonic function then for any x in omega and for any r such so that the ball center x radius r is contained in omega we have that u x is the average of u y on the sphere of radius r center x which is also equal to the average of u over the entire ball center x radius r. So this is a very strong and nice property. So uh, if you have a harmonic function if at any point you take a ball round it and take the average of the function on the sphere or on the ball it does not matter you will recover the value at the center okay this is like uh, so this is uh, and it is a very simple proof uh, it is just change a variable and then differentiate. Uh, and then you and use Gauss divergence theorem. There is only 3 lines in the proof I have told you all the 3 change it to because you want what you want to do if we take phi of r is 1 over n times alpha n this is the surface area r power n minus 1 integral over the boundary of the ball which is the sphere u of y ds y. So if I make a change of variable this can be become 1 by n alpha n integral the boundary of the unit ball of uh, u of x plus r times i. This is just a change of variable. Now if I want to do phi dash of r I can now differentiate I cannot differentiate here because this also depends on r there is a boundary which is depending on r and so it is difficult so I change it to a fixed boundary and then differentiate then I get 1 by n alpha n into integral grad u of x plus r psi into psi ds and then I go back so this is 1 by n alpha n r power n minus 1 integral db of xr of grad u of y psi is y minus x by r ds y. Now here you have a gradient and this is nothing but the unit normal on the surface of the sphere you x is the center so the unit normal is just y minus x by r. So here you have exactly by the Gauss divergence theorem this becomes n alpha n r power n minus 1 integral db of Laplace n u ds. by the Gauss divergence theorem and we know u is harmonic so this is 0. So phi is independent of r so phi of r equals phi of 0 which is the integration over circle sphere of radius 0 and so that is just the value of the function. So you get the other one is immediate from this uh, you can easily do that okay and the thing is that the converse is also true. So let us see an immediate application of this. So if u is c2 in omega and c uh, up to the closure continuous in the closure is a harmonic function then the maximum of u is the same as the maximum on the boundary the maximum in the whole domain is just the maximum on the boundary. And if omega is connected and u achieves its maximum at a point in the interior 
then it has to be a constant function. So it tells you if you have a non-constant harmonic function, the maximum can never be achieved in the interior of the domain, the maximum is always achieved only on the boundary. So what is the proof? You take x0 such that inside the domain such that it achieves the maximum, then take any ball of radius r which is contained in omega. So r should be less than the distance of x0 from the boundary. Then m is ux0 equal to this equal to sign missing here, which is the average in the ball 1 over alpha n xn be uy. But uy is less than or equal to m and therefore if you take the average that will also be less than or equal to m. So you have m on both sides, so you have equality throughout. So this is possible only if u is identically m in the ball. So if u achieves its maximum at a point in the interior, it achieves its maximum in a neighborhood. So the set of all points where u achieves its maximum is an open set. But because u is continuous, it is also a closed set. A set can be open and closed in a connected space only if it is the whole thing. It is not empty, we know that and therefore uh, it has to be there. So this proves the second statement and therefore the first statement follows from this. So this is a very uh, useful uh, maximum principles are very very useful uh, properties of uh, elliptic solutions of elliptic PDE and a lot of geometric uh, results and many uh, estimates for the sizes of the solution many things can be got from the maximum principles. It is a very powerful tool. So one important consequence of the maximum principle is the uniqueness for the Dirichlet problem. Dirichlet problem means you solve, you prescribe u on the boundary. So omega is a bounded domain and consider minus Laplace in u equals f in omega and u is given on the g on the boundary. So if these are continuous functions, then in this class of C2 intersection C, you have only one solution because if you have two solutions, then the difference Laplace in u will be 0 and u will be 0 on the boundary. But you know that if it achieves a maximum in the interior, then it, it has to be a constant and since it is 0, it so uh, since 0 on the boundary, so u1 minus u2 has to be less than or equal to 0. So the function will achieve its maximum only on the boundary which is 0, so u1 minus u2 is less than or equal to 0. And now you change the roles of u1 and u2, do the same thing. So you get u2 minus u1 is also less than or equal to 0. So u1 is identically equal to u2. So a uh, very simple consequence of the maximum principle is the uniqueness of the solution to a Dirichlet problem. Whenever we look at PDEs, we look at or uh, even ODEs, we look at three things. Does there exist a solution? Is the solution unique? And the third one is a little more uh, complicated question does the solution depend continuously on the data in some suitable topology okay. If all these three are there then you say that the problem is well posed in the sense of Hadamard. So this is always we look for existence we have to because otherwise there is no point looking at the differential equation. We would like to have a unique solution if possible and then we would like to know if it is stable if the solution is stable namely if you uh, modify the data a little bit the solution does not change too much and that is very important because most differential equations cannot be solved exactly especially partial differential equation closed form solution is all uh, not uh, in fashion or it is most of them do not admit them and therefore one would look at numerical solutions and numerical means you are making perturbations all the time and therefore if you make approximate something then the solution should not go away somewhere else okay it should stay close to it. So these are the three important things we look for okay so that was a quick uh, preview of uh, I mean uh, bird say view of what happens in the elliptic case. So now we look at the parabolic problem. For this we need a different technique. No? We need what to is known as the Fourier transform. So we take an integrable function that means the integral of mod x over the whole space is finite 
and you define f hat xi is integral over rn e power minus 2 pi i x dot xi this is the inner scalar product oops this is the scalar product in rn x dot xi is sigma xi xi i okay fx so this is called the fourier transform and it is well defined if you take the absolute value and estimate this integral e power minus 2 pi x i is of modulus 1 and mod f x integral that is finite already we know that is why we need an integrable function to define the Fourier transform. It is bounded it is bounded by this integral and it is continuous that is a nice application of the dominated convergence theorem in uh, measure theory and in fact it is uniformly continuous also and it is it vanishes at infinity this is what is called the Riemann Lebig lemma okay. So these are properties of this Fourier transform. So what are the other properties uh, of this you take a vector h in Rn and tau h f is called the translation of f evaluated at x is f of x minus h so you shift the origin by h. So then you uh, this, uh, this is called the translation of a function so it is just a change of origin. Now if you shift a function and then take the Fourier transform it is equivalent to multiplying the Fourier transform of the original function by e power minus 2 pi i h dot psi okay so that is a nice relation and in Fourier transform you always have a dual relation you take the Fourier transform and then translate the function it is equivalent to taking the Fourier transform of the original function multiplied by a exponential okay. So these two are dual to each other one and two so here you first take the translation then the Fourier transform you multiply the original by a exponential you multiply the function by a exponential and then take the Fourier transform it is equivalent to first taking the Fourier transform and then translating. Now if you rescale the uh, coordinates x going to x by lambda then the Fourier transform is like this g hat xi is lambda power n f hat lambda xi. So these are all very trivial properties which you just write the definition and do the calculation it will come. Yes. Another nice property is that if f and g are integrable then the convolution is also integrable then the Fourier transform of the convolution is just the usual product. So the convolution product via the Fourier transform goes to the algebraic product so just the so this is a very beautiful property of the Fourier transform. And if f is infinitely differentiable and decreases rapidly at infinity okay that is a technical condition which I would not uh, elaborate upon then if you take the Fourier transform and differentiate it it is equivalent to multiplying the Fourier uh, function by a polynomial and then taking the Fourier transform. So So then you have the dual also if you take the Fourier transform and multiply by polynomial it is equivalent to first differentiating the function and then taking the Fourier transform. So these two are dual to each other multiplication by a polynomial and then Fourier transform is the differentiation and differentiation of a Fourier of a function and then Fourier transform is equivalent to multiplying the polynomial function uh, Fourier transform by a polynomial. As an example if you take f x equals e power minus mod x square then the Fourier transform can be computed explicitly it is pi to the n by 2 e power minus pi square mod psi square. So it is something like an eigenvector uh, of this operator if you think of this as a linear operator the e power minus mod x square more or less remains as it is under the Fourier transform except for a scale change the function looks the same 
Okay, so why did I say all this? So now I want to use the Fourier transform to solve the heat equation. So you look at the initial value problem u t minus Laplace in u equal to 0 x in r n t positive and u of x 0 is u 0 of x. So on the x axis I am producing. So the in this case the characteristic is the t axis and therefore I can prescribe data on the x axis and expect to solve the problem. There is no problem the Cauchy problem has a solution. The previous case was elliptic there were no characteristics so I did not worry about I could prescribe the data on the boundary and hope to solve it. Now the characteristic is the vertical line so I can prescribe on the x axis initial function and therefore I have here u of x 0 is. So this is called the initial value problem for the heat equation. So we treat T as a parameter and apply the Fourier transform with respect to x. So u t just becomes u hat t and now I have Laplacian of u which means I am differentiating twice and each time you know if you differentiate the uh, a function and take the Fourier transform you multiply by a corresponding polynomial 2 pi i is i i okay. So I get 2 pi 4 pi square mod xi square comes there the mi i square is minus 1 so the minus becomes a plus and I get u hat mod xi square is sigma mod xi i square so equal to 0 and I just take the Fourier transform of the initial value. So this is an ODE which we know how to solve okay you have first derivative is a linear ODE so solution comes in terms of the exponential. So you have here u hat of xi t is u naught of xi into e power minus 4 pi square mod xi square t. So if you look at the second function there and look at this they look similar. So now this is a product of two Fourier transforms this is a Fourier transform of something this is a Fourier transform of something. So this is a product of two Fourier transforms so it is the Fourier transform of the convolution okay. So that was the property we had before. So if you have the product of two Fourier transform it is the Fourier transform of the convolution and then I go back to this condition here so I put them all together. So I can express u hat as a Fourier transform of this function so u of x t becomes 1 by 4 pi t to the n by 2 integral r n e power minus x mod x minus y square by 4 t u naught y dy. So this is the solution of the heat equation with the initial data u0 of x. So using the Fourier transform we are able of course there are lot of justification which we have to do here I mean when can we take the Fourier transform when is all this valid what are the conditions on u naught etc. But assuming they are all okay they are all technical conditions but we have in general a solution like this. So looking at this we can immediately draw some interesting conclusions. The first one if u naught is non-negative then u of x is strictly positive for all time. So I have a u naught which is non-negative I am multiplying by an exponential and integrating taking the convolution so this will be strictly positive for all time. So this what does this mean it is a bit counterintuitive. you know heat equation is all about heating a bar let us take have an infinite bar and I heat it then I am saying that instantaneously the entire rod gets heated up everywhere u of x, x, x t is the temperature so if the temperature is strictly positive so even if I heat in a small portion u naught of compact support instantaneously the entire rod has got heated up there is a positive temperature everywhere. So you will probably say but this does not look right the answer is no it is positive but when you go very far away it will be so small so close to 0 that you will not be able to measure it okay but still it is positive okay so that is the property. So even 
as you go x tends to infinity the solution will exponentially decay. So, it will be positive, but it will be very 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 small. So, that it is undetectable. So, this is called the infinite speed of propagation of signals. So, even if u naught has compact support u of x t will be non zero when all of uh, for all x when t is positive this is the first property. If u naught is continuous then u of x t is c infinity even analytic for all t positive. Again let us go back to the formula we have a convolution, convolution has this nice property if you take a c infinity function and a continuous function and take the convolution the resulting function is c infinity okay because the convolution has the property that when you differentiate a convolution it is the same as differentiating one of the components and then taking the convolution with the other component. Now, if one component is c infinity then all the burden of differentiation is borne by that function. So, so even if you took for instance this example of y stress everywhere continuous nowhere differentiable function and then you convolve it with a c infinity function the result will be c infinity function. So, however bad your initial function is the convolution will be c infinity. So, this is with a c infinity function here the exponential is a c infinity function. So, however bad your initial data u naught is the resulting function is going to be a nice c infinity function and in fact it is even a real analytic function. So, the result as a result the heat equation is not reversible what do I mean by this suppose I gave you originally a initial data okay, and said how the heat equation temperature evolves. Now, if I say at temperature T equals 100 this is what I want as temperature and find out the initial data. So, I want to solve the equation backwards I cannot do it why cannot I do it because I know that given any initial data instantaneously the solution becomes analytic. So, at t equals 100 it must definitely be some nice analytic function and even I cannot prescribe an arbitrary analytic function there are several properties it has to satisfy before it can qualify to be a solution of the heat equation. Okay. So, I cannot give an arbitrary temperature that t equals 100 and say produce for me a initial condition for which it will reach this in that time. So, the heat equation cannot be reversed because of this infinite smoothing which happens immediately. Okay, so, now let us move to the third one which is the wave equation. So, now we have n equals 1 like what the initial value problem u t t minus u x x equal to 0 u of x 0 equals f x and u t of x 0 equals x. Again I am prescribing data here why because the characteristics are these two lines x plus t equals constant and x minus t equals constant. So, lines like this are the characteristic. So, I am prescribing the initial data only on the x axis and therefore, now if I is here. So, for the Laplace equation we just straight away integrated for the heat equation we use the Fourier transform for the wave equation in each dimension we will use a different technique. Okay. So, that is the, uh, the thing becomes more and more complex as we go. So, we first in one dimension namely one space dimension x, x here varies just oops uh, okay. So, this is on uh, yeah x is in r n n equals 1. So, x is in r okay. So, you make a change of variable x equals xi plus t as uh, xi equals x plus t and eta equals x minus t inspired by these characteristics here. And then if you substitute and rewrite this equation u t t minus u x x in the new variables it just becomes u xi eta equal to 0. So, the derivative with respect second derivative with respect to xi eta is 0. So, this means 
this is a function if you go work back and integrate this equation u of xi eta equal to 0 it is a very simple exercise to see that u of xi eta should only be a function of xi plus a function of eta it cannot be anything else cannot be you cannot mix them. So, if you go back u of x t will be f of x plus t plus g of x minus t. at t equals 0. So, we now apply the initial condition. So, at t equals 0 f x plus g x equals f x which on differentiation will give you f dash plus g dash equals f dash ok I just keep it aside. Then there is a condition on the derivative u t of x 0 equals g of x and that gives me f dash x minus g of x g dash x equals g of x. So, we have f dash plus g dash equals something f dash minus g dash equals something. So, we can get f dash and g dash separately and then integrate it. So, if you do all that algebra you will get u of x t equals one half of f of x plus t plus f of x minus t plus one half integral x minus t to x plus t g of z d z. So, this is the solution of the initial value problem in r uh, space one space dimension uh, and one time dimension. So, this is called the solution of D'Alembert. Okay. So, now let us look at the properties of this u is only as smooth as the initial data. So, if you look at this thing here you have just f here and then g. So, if the function cannot be better than the smoothness of f. So, uh, you saw in the heat equation if you have initial data instantaneously you the solution became analytic. In the hyperbolic case uh, it just stays there I mean whatever smoothness you have initially that will be propagated because along the characteristics singularities are propagated. So, you can only expect smoothness as much as this. The values of u at x t depends only on the values of the initial data in interval x minus t x plus t. So, you see here u of x t is f at x plus t and x minus t and the integral of g on the interval x minus t x plus t. So, you can prescribe f and g all over the real axis, but if you want x t So, a point x t here I look at the two characteristics which pass through this point. So, this is uh, x minus t and x plus t ok and whatever may be f and g elsewhere it is only the values here which are going to influence the value at of u at x t. So, this is called the domain of dependence. So, this depends only on this. Similarly, if you have a point here and look at the two characteristics which emanate from it, this value will only influence at time t the solution somewhere in the neighborhood of this interval. So, that is called the domain of influence. So, that is the direct consequence of this formula. that is what I just said this. So, in particular if the initial data has compact support then at every time t the solution also will only have compact support and this is again in contrast with the heat equation because there initially even if you had compact support instantaneously the heat spreads everywhere whereas in the case of sound or light if you have initial uh, this is in one dimension of course. So, if you have initial data of compact support at every time t the disturbance is localized to some compact set beyond that it has no influence whatsoever. So, you have this is called the finite speed of propagation of signals. So, signals cannot spread in say with infinite speed ok. So, now let us so this is one dimension. 
So now we want to go to three dimensions. So for deliberately I am skipping two dimensions. So I am going straight to the third dimension. So you take a function h and define what is called a spherical mean namely the average of the function on a ball of radius r center x and so this, this is the average which I have written there. Now just as I did in the case of the elliptic thing that it is the same arguments so you can change to a fixed thing and then differentiate if I want to differentiate this function with respect to r then r occurs in the boundary oh no. r occurs in the boundary so I cannot differentiate it so I change it to a fixed boundary and then I can do whatever I like. Then using again Gauss theorem and so on just as I did last time you can now get an equation here this is the Laplace This is the Laplacian in polar coordinates for a radial function so that that is just that part here and this is the Laplacian in x. So if you, you this can be explicitly computed starting with this formula here. So this is called Darboux's equation. Now you take the solution of the wave equation with the initial data as before treat t as a parameter and find form the spherical means. Then you can recover the original function from the spherical mean by taking r equals 0 namely integrating over spheres of radius 0 which means you just have the point to punctual values and therefore you get back the function. So we will instead look at this rather than this and initial values also initial uh, data Cauchy data also has this if you take the spherical means you get all this. When n equals 3 a miracle it is a very special case so d2 u m by d2 u t2 is d2 by dr this is the Darboux equation and uh, th this came because of the Laplacian the Darboux equation this is what we put on the left hand side here this is Laplacian x of mh but that is nothing but dt2 by because u is the solution of the wave equation this becomes a time derivative there. So that Laplacian gave you this and the other side with n equals 2 gives you this which is nothing but d2 by dr2. So you get a one dimensional wave equation for rmu now which we know how to solve. So we can write down the D'Alembert solution. Which is this uh, formula here. This is just exactly the solution which I wrote for one dimension. And then as r goes to 0 we know that we recover u from this and these two this quotient becomes uh, the derivative here d by dt of t m f and this when you put r equals 0 gives back the value at t and now you can uh, rewrite it in proper way uh, go back and uh, you can, what is mg what is m f so the if you use the definition then you get this expression for the uh, solution of the wave so this is the solution of the wave equation in three dimensions. So what are the properties of this now? If f is in Cs and g is in Cs plus 1 then u is in Cs minus 1 because in the final solution I have to differentiate f a little bit. So there is a loss of one order of regularity in this case from the initial data. So if you started with Cs s times differentiable initial data solution is only s minus 1 times differentiable. So even between the case n equals 1 and n equals 3 there is a difference in the n equals 1 what did I tell you the solution is as smooth as the initial data if it is whatever it is f was sitting there like that and therefore but if you go to n equals 3 in fact for all higher dimensions the it in fact is a little less smooth 
than the initial datum. This is called the focusing effect in higher dimensions. Now look at the domain of defend, uh, dependence, it is a surface mod y minus x equals t because everything depends on the values on that surface. So, it is a now a surface not a solid region previously in one dimensions it was an interval it is a solid region now it is just a surface it is just the boundary of a solid region. And if f and g have support in a ball of radius rho then u of t has support in a spherical shell which is between the ball of radius t minus rho and t plus rho. So, this is uh, again the solution is of compact support, but this has a very interesting consequence uh, this what is known as Huygens principle in physics. So, the support is between two, two shells two spherical shells. So, as and this radius keeps expanding. So, for all time for all points there will be a time when it will come out of the inner radius and sit here. Okay, because these radii are expanding as time goes. So, given any point in space eventually the solution will become identically 0 there. So, this is called Huygens principle for instance I am now talking so sound waves light waves these are all uh, uh, carried by the wave equation. So, if I stop talking now after some time you would not hear me which is good otherwise imagine all the sounds keep accumulating in your head then what similarly if you switch off the lights you will not see light after some time it will not just accumulate okay. and that is because the, this support of the solution keeps increasing uh, expanding and therefore given any point sooner or later it will come inside the inner circle and therefore the solution will die out completely. And initial data has compact support then the solution is of course compact uh, and expanding I have just explained that and the solution decays with time. So, even even though it is now in a very big compact set the solution will be quite small uh, in because the energy is conserved there is something called conservation of energy of these things and since the same energy has to be distributed over a bigger set each time. So, it has to be more people to feed less food you get. So, it is the same principle. So, it uh, uh, solution will decay with time. When do we stop? Okay, so then I should wind up first. Okay. So this is called the Hadamard's method of descent for n equals two. So I went from one, I went to three using some trick of calculus. Now I am coming down to two. How do I do that? I treat n equals two as a special case of n equals three. Namely, I imagine that the Cauchy data doesn't depend on x three, and then I take the solution on x three equal to zero and then I produce. So, this time I will get a solution and now if you look at the domain of dependence it is now again a solid region. So, like in one dimension in two dimension also it is a solid region. So, this Huygens principle will not work. So, for instance if I have a water I throw a stone it will make ripples it will make waves. Now, after some time for the naked eye you will think the water has settled down but water will never settle down there will be oscillations inside disturbances inside, but so small that you cannot detect it. It is just like the heat equation as I said instantaneously it gets heated up, but you cannot really feel it because it is too small far away. Similarly, these disturbances because the domain of dependence is now a solid region once a disturbance always a disturbance, but it will die down in time and so you cannot feel it the decay in time is there. Next is of course, I, I will just not talk about this because I do not have time is the separation of variables. So, this was another technique where you look at break the equation uh, solution into function of x and function of t and try to solve it and this is what gave rise to Fourier series. Okay. So, this is how Fourier series were born and there was a huge controversy for nearly 75 years in Europe between 1750 and 1820 or so thereabouts because on one hand you had the Fourier series solution given by Bernoulli and uh, he did it even before Fourier for the wave equation Fourier did it for the heat equation and they said the function can be expanded in terms of sines and cosines. 
and on the other hand you had D'Alembert solution which was general solution and Euler objected saying how can any function be written as the sum of periodic functions and so on. So they were all fighting all the time till finally Dirichlet told what is meant by convergence of the Fourier series, when will it converge etc. And in understanding all this con uh, convergence the Riemann integral gave way to the Lebesgue integral one had to understand the nature of infinite sets countable, uncountable all these things came up. Lebesgue integration came in to replace Riemann integral and all that. So this uh, not to be taken lightly okay. and in higher dimensions you get what is called an eigenvalue problem and the study of the eigenvalues of the Laplace operator is itself a separate topic for uh, discussion and it is a beautiful convolution uh, confluence of geometry analysis and PDEs. So I will I will just say only that since uh, I do not want to hold you up. Finally I will come to uh, a nonlinear equation called Burgers equation. So this is called ut plus ux equal to 0 with the initial data. So a characteristic curve now I define as a solution of this differential equation here. These two buttons are so close forever that is why I did not want this. So now if you can solve this equation and then along this characteristic curve u is u of x t t so differentiate du by d t it becomes u t plus u x x dash which is u t plus u u x equal to 0 which means which is the equation itself. So u is constant along a characteristic curve so this becomes a constant <coughs> if this is a constant then the solution will be x naught plus u naught x naught t which is immediate because dx by dt equals a constant so we are just getting straight line. So how do you solve the problem? Theoretically I have solved it. Take any point x t and I just have to look at the characteristic curve passing through that point. I slide back whatever is the initial value here that is the same value here. So that is what this equation say along a characteristic curve the solution is a constant. Of course I do not know where these characteristic curves are unless I do it. So no, in fact I know it because at each point I take the straight line of slope u of u naught of x naught so that is all. So, but this is not as simple as it looks sorry for this bad picture let me take an in an initial data which is 1 in the negative axis and 0 after 1 and some nice smooth function here. I draw the characteristic curves so here dx by dt is 0 so the characteristic curves are vertical lines here dx by dt is 1 so the characteristic curves are like this. Now you take a point p like this now which way am I going to slide I do I slide like this or do I slide like this I do not know so that means the solution very rapidly develops discontinuities okay and they are called shocks. So for instance this is a typical prototype of the study of the flow past an aeroplane. So if you want the aeroplane to fly properly we have to study equations of this kind where shocks are going to develop because of what are called uh, equations like these which are called hyperbolic conservation laws. So up to now we have been looking at a solution of a PDE as a classical solution namely it has as many continuous derivatives as the order of the equation but now we are forced to look at generalize the notion of a solution where even discontinuous functions may be interpreted as a solution. So that is the beginning of the theory of distributions that is a completely different story and therefore a good point to stop. So if uh, things which I have said today can be found in uh, these two books for instance there are many books I just picked two important ones thank you.